In a move to help the nation move forward and rebuild in a non-partisan way, the president appointed an advisory council to serve at his pleasure. The council will complement existing structures by acting as a quality control unit of sorts. This is a move yet again by the president to support the open for business mantra and the goals outlined in the transitional stabilization program. And the 24 member group is fairly balanced with experienced captains in their own areas. For example, Sakunda Holdings chief, ex chief executive owner, Mr. Kudakwashi Taguire and Zimbabwe National Chamber of Commerce President Divine Lukula. Now, there's no doubt these names are impressive and would inspire anyone to think that the president has surrounded himself with a stellar team that will advise him thoroughly on how to move progressively on the many problems our nation faces. But we have some questions. Are the youth adequately represented in this council? Considering that the youth will inherit the fruits of the council's work only 11 years from now when we hit Vision 2030, why are they not better represented? What are the duties of vice presidents, ministers and their deputies, members of parliament, senators, ministers of state, spokespersons of both party and presidency? Are we not just wasting precious resources at this point? Has Nick Fury called the Justice League because the Avengers can't deal with Thanos? As you are watching this right now, fuel shortage have crept on us again like a cold that simply won't go away. If the aforementioned list of people have failed to advise on such issues, what's another 24 supposed to do? That's another question. What is the group of people supposed to advise the president that he already doesn't know? Our government's issue is not a lack of knowledge or situational awareness of what's going on and what the problems are. The issue has been poor implementation and a track record that may suggest that they may also have a lack of political will to resolve these issues. So perhaps that's why this council might be necessary. If so, then this is brilliant. But the final question, which is in the line of the open for business mantra, a core reason for the formation of the policy is this. Speaking to the press, Chief Secretary of the President and Cabinet, Dr. Mishek Sibanda, said the advisory council was mandated with organizing interactions between the president and local and international businesses. Some of the people on this list are serious business people with international reputations and connections. Right now, our nation is stuck in the middle of accusations of alleged human rights violations and recent controversies like switching off the internet. Are these council members prepared to risk their reputations working with a government that makes questionable decisions that jeopardize and contradict interest from foreign and local investors? Well, only time for tell, but for now, we remain cautiously optimistic. ZimSec released their 2018 O-Level results with a shocking 32% pass rate. But before you lose your mind and demand explanations and resignations, bear in mind that this was an improvement from the previous year's 28%. This trend of low O-Level pass rates is not new, with previous years averaging in the low 20s as well. However, despite a poor showing at ZimSec O-Level, we still maintain a high literacy rate of 94%. But an even bigger problem lingers in the back of all of this. Zimbabwe has a critical skills shortage with a skills deficit of 62%. According to a survey conducted by a local independent HR consultancy, Zimbabwean employees lack business acumen, research skills, innovation, financial literacy, business report writing skills, critical thinking, numerical reasoning, people management and time management, and business etiquette, among many other things. So basically, you lying about your proficiency in Excel should be the least of your employer's worries. The thing is, there's a definite mismatch between what is being taught in academic institutions and what is needed in the job market. Higher and Tertiary Education Science and Technology Minister Professor Amon Murirwa was previously stated saying, we can only become a middle income economy when we have the critical skills that are needed in this economy. Some experts have said that the problem starts at school with teachers not preparing students well enough for the real world. But this is harsh on teachers, who often have to deal and put up with dismal salaries, overcrowded classrooms, and at times, a disruptive political environment that leads to the closure of school. Now, in light of all of this, the finance minister has recognized the growing issues and has allocated an impressive $1.5 billion budget to the education sector this year, $1.3 billion of that going to primary and secondary schools. With that kind of investment, 
it'll be interesting to see how far or how well things will come out this year. But this story doesn't just end at education. Zimbabwe is producing way more graduates than there are jobs, forcing many into the informal sector. Your degree nowadays is about as meaningful as Mo Salah's Pushkas Award. It recognizes that you're good at something, but it doesn't actually give you what you deserve. The informal sector is in front and center of a nationwide debate on another social crisis as authorities have embarked on a widespread operation of the demolition of unregistered businesses in Bari, Chitungiza, and other areas. So here's what happened. Allegedly, a 24-hour notice to evacuate areas deemed illegal for informal trade was issued by the Harare City Council. Vendors were told to remove themselves from these areas or they would be removed by authorities. Now, in light of the recent clashes between authorities and the citizens, many vendors and sellers begrudgingly began moving and emotional videos and pictures began circulating telling the story of a government using its might incorrectly to drive people out who have nowhere else to go. But the Harare City Council has dis distanced itself from the ongoing demolition of unregistered businesses. The mayor of Harare, Herbert Gumba, said, I quote, We have not made a resolution to that effect. My council's policy is that of engagement, and we have always advocated for that. He has promised to investigate the matter, but has urged vendors to register with the council for them to get better trading sites. So the council has distanced themselves from the violence, but not from the moving of the vendors, and many are in support of this move. Those in support say the tuck shops were popping up everywhere and they were not paying council levies. They were destructing and obstructing traffic, and with no running water, they were making it impossible to control major health risks like cholera. These tuck shops were also at the center of the out-of-control black market pricing of basic commodities. At a tuck shop, cooking oil could go for $15, when the in-store retail price at OK, perhaps, could be $4. When pressed about these issues, the vendors stated that they still had to pay rent to landlords, even if they didn't look like they were. Who were these landlords? Who were these people who were still demanding money, even though the place didn't look like it was taking any money? These tuck shops were a testament to the desperate situation some Zimbabweans find themselves in. But they're also a testament to the exploitation of a desperate situation some Zimbabweans will carry out. But the million dollar question, the $139 million question to be exact is, what is happening with the promised multi-million dollar investment of Mbari and Chitungiza to spruce up markets? If the government honored their promise to be able to invest thoroughly in finding a proper place for these people to sell, we may not have these problems in the first place. And now for my POV. The government needs to rebuild trust with people at all levels of life. John Gottman is a psychologist and relationship expert who wrote an insightful book called The Science of Building Trust. In the book, he explains that trust is built in windows, windows of opportunity. So for example, if your wife asks you, where were you last night? A window presents itself. Tell the truth, you build trust in her. Lie, and you erode that trust between the two of you. But if you let the lies get out of hand, you could reach a stage where even when you do tell the truth or do something noble, you're still a liar. Statements like the charity charamba challenge or the internet being congested or the bond note is one is to one with the US erode trust. Actions like removing vendors using armed forces or running up a huge bill to go on European tour with fuel queues coming back erodes trust. So even when you form advisory councils or visit hospitals, it gets lost in a sea of mistrust and disappointment. Trust between a government and its people is built in two ways. One, transparency through action. Follow through on your promises. The opposite erodes trust. Lastly, Larry Summers, who is a former advisor to Bill Clinton, says, People's faith in government to do big things lies in their ability to handle routine responsibilities. Pick up the bins on time. Pay civil servants on time and fairly. And ensure that one's ability to manage their household is not a headache at your expense. This is a matter of priority. Act on this and both local and international communities might believe that maybe you are really and truly open for business. This is Kudamangwe saying good morning, good day, and good night. <laughs>